Hardwell. How are you? I'm great. How are you, man? I'm doing really good, man. You know, you, your energy, I can tell even though I'm looking at you through a screen, which is just all too common still these days, that your energy is great and that you want to do this. And that must be a relief for you, that that coming back with new music and, and getting ready to do tours and do shows after an extended break, that there's a willingness to do this, that you're not on the treadmill anymore and someone's picking the speed, you know? Yeah, it feels amazing. I really needed that time off, but on the first hand, I... I never hated music. I had never hated my life or fans or anything, you know. I just I was just exhausted of the whole touring and I felt really disconnected from my own music because it felt like almost like a formula that I had to produce like the same things over and over again. If I didn't do that, the fans won't they wouldn't accept it. And it was like an endless cycle of all those things. And when I when I took the break and well, I really took a break though, like almost a year that I haven't visited my own studio while my studio is in my house. So wow. <laughs> when I got back in the studio, I f- yeah, I felt really refreshed and really happy to create something new that was more close to me, more personal. I'm really, you know, grateful that you want to have this conversation. I've been waiting for somebody to raise their hand and say, hey, you want to talk about that crazy few years that happened, you know, a decade ago where it was just out of control and the business and the money and the success and the the momentum and the energy and the love and the judgment and all the stuff that comes with just being in the zeitgeist. You don't want to talk about that. And, and I feel like you're the first, you know, best person to have this conversation with because you reached heights that almost no one else in your peer group reached. And yet you had the foresight and the space and balance to say, I need to stop. And I, and I think there were some people who should have stopped and didn't and some who tried and couldn't. And I guess my question to you is how hard was it making that decision when there was so much wind at your back? It was a really tough decision. It was such a hard decision that I, and I didn't even reach out to my own parents or my manager or anybody in the first place normally like i i uh, if something is like I, 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 if i don't know how to deal with something the first person i talk to is my or my parents or my manager or even like personal stuff but this felt so personal i was struggling with something inside myself that i didn't talk with anybody and i just one day i was just like i have i have to take a break just i opened my email and i only emailed my my, my dad and my manager and it's like, I'm taking a break. This is not a discussion. I'm just taking a break. I'm done. I'm done living this wonderful dream that everybody thinks it is, but I'm just done dealing with jet lags. My health, my, I couldn't sleep anymore. My own house felt like a hotel room. It was super weird. Like a lot of signals that I had to stop for a while. And then on the other hand, how hard the decision was, even harder when you think about like, yo, uh, my tour manager, uh, he has quit his job, my sound guy, the guy who makes my visuals. So yeah, it was a really tough decision, but I had, I had to do it. And I'm really glad that even like in my inner circle, my own team really accepted it. It's great for us as fans to better understand what some of the challenges of that era were. Because people talk about that time when EDM was a moment and they think it's like, the, and, and it was the greatest time. I was like, oh man, I was leaving college. I was doing this. And I just always remember those events and those moments and the Hardwell DJ set from that festival and that festival. But man, it was, it was a lot, right? It was a lot. And, and I think that, you know, the dream of, of constant travel and success and everything else that came with it, also the need to prop yourself up and be able to deal with people at that level of intensity can drive DJs and others into into al- a lot of alcohol. I drank a lot of alcohol when I was DJing at the height of that. I was doing a lot of shows. I was in a lot of festivals you were on. There was always alcohol in the dressing room. In some cases, it was drugs for people. I never did that. There was a lot of that kicking around. How was that for you? Like, was it challenge? Like, how did you get through that time just as a person dealing with people? Obviously, there was like a lot of alcohol as well. I never had an alcohol problem, luckily, but I always could could handle my alcohol. But that was like the painkiller, man. When you felt uh, 
oh man, I'm tired. I just, you know, I just did two shows yesterday. Now I'm here tomorrow world closing main stage, whatever. Okay, vodka Red Bull, here we go. And it works. But our, that's like the worst thing to do. Now, now I realize that, but at that point it was just normal. Luckily, I'm, I, I never used drugs in my life because I'm scared of it. That's like the biggest reason. But um, yeah, I, I see it. That that lifestyle, it's not healthy. Nobody is gonna continue doing that for like twenty years in a row. That's impossible. Even on the on such a high, I did like two hundred flights a year, and come in combination with. Uh, sleeping uh, on 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 the, in different time zones, drinking, not working out, eating a lot of burgers because you're basically living at the airport. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, this is the part that f nobody, as you mentioned, nobody talks about it, but there's a reason for it because a lot of people are like, why are you complaining, man? I've heard that from a lot of artists in different genres when we have conversations like this. Is a part of this. It's almost like a shame mechanism that makes people scared to kind of show that side of the life but we need to know as fans and as an industry we need to know because that old excuse of like this is what you wanted this is every dream of yours coming true you're making money you're doing what you love great but I'm also a person and with that success comes the responsibility to as you said keep people employed there's a fear of not wanting to lose your position in the queue, right? I've got the success. I, I've worked hard for it. I don't want to lose it. Like, let's take a look at number one DJ in the world, right? That matters in Mix Mag. That matters in those magazines. That is a serious calling card, and you've won it multiple times. But you can honestly, like, I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Once you get to that cover, then the fear kicks in. Because what happens if I don't get it next year? Exactly. That's 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 a pressure on your shoulders, and there is no way you can get rid of that, because you are that number one DJ. Oh, so that's that, that's it. That was my career. I can only come down from this point. You know, it's it's weird. And talking about that, that was like the weirdest year ever in my career, because I worked so long. Like started in Holland doing all those shows, go to Belgium, Europe, eventually America, playing all the shows, becoming the number one DJ in the world, they building a fan base. You become the number one DJ in the world and people don't, don't buy tickets to see you anymore. They buy tickets to see the number one DJ instead of Hardwell. It's so weird. A lot of people won't realize how much work you put into your craft before people even knew what you'd become. Hardwell is not like your real name per se. You know, it's, it's something that you created to help to position and, and build a world around your music. Um, but who you were before that you were already teaching, you know, learning instruments, applying yourself. Um, you were somewhat of a teenage prodigy. I mean, you were signed at the age of 14, right? I mean, in a way, you never got a chance to live a normal childhood. That's true. Yeah, I was 14 when I even started playing the clubs in Holland already and headlining festivals. And that's always like a story that comes back in every interview. But I had to take my parents with me because I wasn't even allowed to enter the club under 18. So... Uh, yeah, I was really, really young, and uh, that 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 really felt when I took that sabbatical. I I really took the time to grow as Robert, as a person, not as the artist anymore, because I invested basically ninety percent of my time on this planet in in the artist, in becoming a bigger and better version of myself as an artist, and never as as a as a person. Robert, can I call you Robert? Of course. <laughs> Robert, when you, thank you, when you think back on that, with a little bit of perspective, and again, let's just make this really clear to anybody who's investing in this conversation, this is not about complaints. Neither Robert nor myself are trying to establish this kind of grim reality around what success is, right? But it does come with a reality that needs to be acknowledged. And so with the benefit of perspective and hindsight, and you think back to yourself as a young child, when you're still a child, I mean, you're a teenager, but you're still, you're a young adult, you're, but you're not, a, you're not at a maturity level yet. Do you think it was healthy for you to start that young? Do you have any, not regrets, regrets is the wrong word because your life is as you make it and it's moving in the right direction, but do you feel like it's too young to begin to play in, a, in, in an adult world? Uh, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. It's, uh, I think the difference is when you're like 14 right now, even like, we can have this is a, a different subject with with social media nowadays like 
all those young, upcoming, inspiring producers, and I'm talking about like the kids from like 12, like 14 years old, before they know they got a record deal or like a release on one of the biggest labels. And it's not normal. Like, I don't regret being that young because I, I kind of had the right guidance from my parents. But if you don't have that, if you don't have people that really care for you, and I'm not talking about like a manager or whatever. No, the people who really know you, the people who will listen to you at your lowest point, tell the, you know, the, the things you're most upset about. I, I get it. It's really important to have like a solid base, like a personal, like a family. And nine out of 10 times, it, those people are your parents. But it's really important to have like a solid base before you go into like a, a breakthrough like that. Because at some point you will get like lost in this world it is it is a maze if you walk in this world it makes sense to me that you would have started so young because you grew up in a community where electronic music has such a powerful and strong foundation and influence around the world that if you're into dance music the term dirty dutch is is is, is no mystery to you and the idea of dutch dance music is like at a forefront i've spoken to many people who make dance music and electronic music at the highest level who often refer to the dutch sound as the gold standard um as for you as a young person growing up, knowing that electronic music was always already thriving, that there was nothing for you to necessarily invent, but there was something for you to fit into. How was that process for you of establishing your name and your style in a city and in a, in a country that already is so steeped in quality? I think what really helped is uh, Thijs Tiesto. He's born and raised in the same super small city in the south of Holland where I'm from. And he was always in the news, like when he became the number one DJ in the world and he did his first concert. And since he was from the same city, it's like, yo, if he can do it, I can, I have a chance, you know? <laughs> he is also a guy from Breda. He's not from Amsterdam. He's also from the same small city. And I just started working on, on, on my production skills. And th that was like different. People don't even understand, like a lot of DJs that don't produce their own music, which is fine, but always, I, will, I was always working on my more production side and after that I became a DJ. I, creating music is always for me like kind of the number one because then you can create something that doesn't exist. And that's always like the best feeling. And that's the, the even better feeling than that is creating something and then playing it out for yourself. Well, I think you made a really important distinction between the, the successful eras of dance and club music and in the, of the past and the one that occurred from 08 to about 13, 14, right? And that distinction, as you, as you eloquently put, was that you were making and creating a sound and then you had to go and play it for people and ultimately bring it to life. Before that, DJs were going in the studio with engineers and trying to bring their DJ sets to life through original music. You know, a lot of people were already playing clubs and DJing and touring around the world, and then someone would be like, you don't have a song to play. It's like, damn, I need to go find make a song so I can play it out. You guys had to figure out how you were going to become performers. It was in reverse. And I can imagine that, that that really raises the anxiety level too because that room you're in right now, Robert, Hardwell Studio is a safe, safe place. What was it like when somebody came in with a packed bag and said, dude, shows to play. You got to bring this, these songs to life. Creating something in here. I always refer to that in, in, my, in, my, in my head as well. When I'm on stage, it's, it's all created in this small room. Everything you hear on like Tomorrowland or Ultra, it just comes from this room, me by myself, creating music. It's, it's just weird that... It still doesn't get to my mind. I think a lot of artists will relate to this, but that you create something, something can come, can, can come to your mind like really quick in 10 minutes you have like basically a, a drum loop. and That's the magic. That's the magic we can never really explain or understand. And then like millions of people are touched by it or listen to it or you're played at a festival in front of 20,000 people. But that's the bit I'm really zeroing in on is, is that you have the ability and the talent and the inspiration and the guidance to be able from, from, from your peers of the past to sit in that room and conjure up magic. But then you have to go and, and, and lean into the process and don't get me wrong, playing shows in front of thousands of people creates a magical feeling, but it's part of a process at that point, right? It's like, all right, I have to go and entertain people now. Do you think you're a natural entertainer or do you have to learn how to do it? No, I really had to learn it. I think it, 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 especially with all the shows in the beginning that I did in Holland, it really took a lot of time for me to, well, get used to being on stage, 
oh, you, it's okay for a DJ to show that you're enjoying what you're doing. Right, right, right. <laughs> Especially in the beginning, I was so focused on mixing. I just didn't want to make any mistakes. I was just focused on mixing and looking down, not looking at the crowds, just make, making sure that all my, all my transitions were like <laughs> in the right, the right timing. And I'm glad you said that because that shows a real, a real detail and care toward the craft of DJing, whereas I think what... Ultimately, part of what undid the EDM craze is that is that after a while, it really became more about the event and less about the craft of DJing. And if you begin in something which, which is which has a soul to it, and then you end up kind of cutting corners on the thing that truly matters in order to get to the end, it's the it's the long it's the long slow goodbye of whatever that is. I think at that point, right? And you're a DJ. You you had to teach yourself how to DJ and become a DJ. How nerve wracking was it when you'd find yourself in rooms with people who'd been doing it longer that you admired, and it was your turn to get up? Because DJs know other DJs, and they we certainly know DJs who can't do it. I, I don't know. Like in, in the beginning, you're just beat matching, but then there was so much more to the art of DJing, like reading the crowd. And yeah. I know this all sounds super cliche, but it's true, you know? You can drop a record in the first 10 minutes of your set and it, 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 the whole record doesn't work. And like later on in the set, like 30 minutes later, it's the biggest hit you could play that night. And that's just experience. You cannot learn that. Like it's there is no rule, there is no guidance, there's no book you can read to understand this. It's making hours in front of thousands of people and just, naturally, I don't know, like it's, it's it's like a sixth sense. I don't know. How welcoming and, and how supportive is the Dutch electronic music scene as a whole? Is it competitive? Is it Does it challenge your ability in order to fit in? Do you have to justify your place? Or is it arms round each other right from the get-go and, and a desire to succeed as a whole? We're all like good friends in every genre. Even like you can tell that, for example, if you take Tiesto and Armin or like from back in the day, when Thais even was like a trans DJ, they even know all the hip hop guys in Holland. Like everybody knows each other in every single genre and everybody's helping each other. And I think th that's a good thing that Holland is that small. You can drive like two hours and you've seen <laughs> almost every city in the country. And that's why everybody knows each other. And the music scene is really small. And I think that really helps. The competition is on such a high level. Like, I, I mean, like the standard of creating music and DJing and that's why basically all the people always say like, I don't know, I don't get this, man. Every DJ from Holland is talented. It's not talented. It's like the standard. So how would you sum up your time? Like in particular, the, the couple of years before we went into quarantine? I really took some time off of music because um, I wanted to reflect on myself as a person. And if I'm going to go back on stage, which, what, what kind of music do I want to play? I, I, I really felt disconnected at some point from I feel myself like I've, I felt disconnected from myself as an artist, even music wise. Was it challenging, Robert, to not open the door and go in your studio? I mean, it's in your house. You are literally ignoring a room in your house. It is in the basement, though. So I have specifically, I have to go downstairs to go to the studio. But um, yeah, I, 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 I just, the moment I walked back into the studio, I just wanted to create whatever I, I, I felt like making. No deadlines, not thinking about, oh, this is going to work on the dance floor. This is a peak time record. This is techno. This is trans. This is I don't care. I just going to make music that I want to hear on a festival. And I just want to create music that I really feel. And I went back in my own vinyl collection, listening to records that I bought as a kid. Like, as you mentioned, I was like 14 years old when I started DJing with vinyl. And I, I just went back to the, the, all those memories, like what was the reason as a young kid, as, as a 14 year old, why I bought this record? There was something significant in this record, a, a, a lead sound, a synth sound, a bass line. What did I like about this record and why? And I do, I've been just listening to all those records for days in a row. And I took that as an inspiration to create the new album. Did you create parameters for yourself of what not to do? Did you retire certain synth presets, you know, drum programs that or, or sample libraries that you'd used in the past? Were you searching for inspiration by not leaning back? Because over time, you just build this library of sounds and it, and it becomes your signature sound. Well, I said goodbye to a lot of samples and patterns and I didn't want to go back to the famous like uh, snare patterns in the build-up. 
like done. Done. I went back to like the old old stuff, like a 909 snare. Uh, um, I, I, the funny thing is, I used a lot of old sample packs, like old sample packs, and not like the the standard cashmere sample bank that everybody is using right now. Not the famous Hardwell Big Room Super Saw since nah. I wanted to create everything from scratch. That's awesome, man. I mean, for you to have created things that other people use because they wanted a taste of your sound and then to turn your back on your own sound, must have felt like you were disassociating yourself from your own identity. It's not that I didn't want to use it. I just wanted to challenge myself. It's so easy to come back, do the same trick again. And were you feeling that way back in 2018? I mean, how visceral was that feeling that like, wow, man, I'm in the back of a minivan on my way to the airport and I've made this song 50 times and I know what's going to work. I know which buttons it's going to press on the crowd. I know what people want to hear. Were you having thoughts of that nature? Was it that clear in your mind? As you just mentioned, that's exactly how, how it went in my, in my head. Like that, um, I think the perfect example was the Tomorrowland 2018 set I played. It's, I, I love that set. Don't get me wrong, but that, in the end, when I when I was in my sabbatical and I watched that that setback, that was exactly what I didn't want to do anymore, because that was that that was so obvious how how I played that set. Not like in a commercial way, but like in a formula way. I think every hardball fan was expecting, oh, he's gonna close with this song. He's gonna probably play that hardball remix in front of that, and I'm, I was done with that. Like now, I'm just DJing again. I'm just having my my SD cards, my USBs, and no order and just banging out stuff that I like to play. And one time it's more techy, the other the other time it's more big roomish. I don't care anymore. And that that's the feeling you need as a DJ. The the album begins with a song called Broken, and uh, it, it's a very personal message at the very at the beginning of an album. You realize that you know you really are introducing us to a personal journey that is then open for us to apply to our own lives and. You finished that introduction with a very clear statement. You know, I'm going to show you who I really am. Um, the idea of creating a new album, coming back and going straight into an album, to me is admirable. This scene wasn't built out of albums. It was built out of songs, singular moments that moved a lot of people and you'd build your set around it. You, It's clear to me you wanted to make that statement that I'm going to come back and I'm going to make a serious statement through a body of work. Yeah, I, I, I really wanted to create this album uh not just a comeback set or a couple of new songs and play my old songs as well and make a combination out of it even for ultra in miami i made the decision to only play new songs I, basically the new album not combined with my old stuff uh well i played spaceman but in a new version i created myself but besides that i just i wanted to make a statement this is what i'm doing right now this is what i love to do and as I just mentioned in the, in the previous question, um, that's DJing, just banging out stuff you like to hear, not playing that hit record that you know the crowd will love. No, just going all in, playing new stuff. And well, that was an anxious moment. I'm just going to be really honest. How did you feel when you walked off stage? Did you feel like it was universally appreciated? Definitely not. That was the thing, because um, it, it felt both. I was like emotionally drained of of, of the tension of a comeback show, playing all the new stuff and knowing that there are a lot of fans expecting me to do that big room stuff and do the hardball mashups with, with hip hop songs and closing with hard style. And nah, that, that didn't happen. So I know a lot of people were like sad or or even, even mad that I didn't do that anymore, that I changed. But that was at that moment when I started releasing the songs of the album and people have access to the higher quality and the, the, the music, how it's supposed to, to sound like. And that was the moment like a lot of people started to appreciate what I was doing. To your point, short of going up there and playing that Tomorrowland set exactly as you did back in 2018, you were never going to get any other reaction. People wanted you to pick up where you left off. I, I, I really felt even for dance music, it was time for for a change, you know, even for me as an artist, I think if you're a true fan, you will appreciate that I'm developing my sound and trying something new. I'm not saying this is better or my old stuff is better. Nothing is better. It's different, but it's great for an artist. I think you should appreciate as a fan and artist that he's trying to develop 
new stuff, trying new styles, try to combine new stuff. Same goes for Swedish House Mafia. They did something totally new. I love that Swedish House Mafia album. Yeah, it's amazing. It's not without its humor, Robert. A song like Pac-Man, first of all, that's not fundamentally and factually true from what we can tell. I don't believe that Pac-Man actually stands for program and control, but the fact that you made that up is an epic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and the story is interesting and it's fun and it's tongue in cheek. And then at the end, you know, you throw just your hat in the ring on it a little bit with, with that sort of, if we had been influenced by Pac-Man, then we'd be running around clubs, throwing pills down our throats and listening to repetitive electronic music. I mean, it's your way I feel of saying, I get it, I'm in on it, I've made it, but don't think that I'm not aware of it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a culture thing almost. Like, we're used to it. This is, this is dance music. We're doing it. And yeah, I, I, when, I, when I heard the, the, whole, the idea of the track and the, the sample, and I loved it, man. That's the most repetitive track on the album. That's the whole cliche thing about it that's what i mean you're in on the joke and, and you've actually you know you've shown that listen you want me to do that i can do that yeah exactly will you do it again if if you feel the urge are you just following your inspiration at this point if if something came to you one day if you went upstairs after this conversation and the right chemistry of ingredients throughout the day led you to want to make something that just hit the big room would you do it yeah never say never i like if i feel the inspiration to make something new but that is that, that that's that's the answer. Something new. I'm not saying I'm not never coming back to big room, but I I will, I will always use that as, as an inspiration if it sounds refreshing. I'm not gonna do the same formula again and uh, making a copy of one of my older songs because it works or it streams. I I will do that, hundred percent. But if I come up with something new and which feels exciting to me, yeah, why not? I th I think about 2018 though, and I think about. Your decision to walk away and coinciding on the same year that we lost one of the great artists of that scene and of and of music in general, and we lost Avicii, and I think a lot has been talked about and con continues to be talked about, thankfully, about his condition and, and ultimately what contributed to 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 his cha the challenges that he faced. Did that was that sort of on your mind at that point? Were you aware that 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 the wheels were turning off for people that you admired and and for your peer group and that? In some respects, you had to like focus on your health. Like hundred percent. Like for me, the the dad of Tim was definitely the trigger for me to well pull pull the trigger myself and like yo, I'm taking a break. That that's it. Like I'm losing one of my friends now, and worst feeling in the world. And yeah, there is no way that there is no solution in between. There is no way you 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 can still tour and then. You, well, obviously, you can stop drinking, take more time off to start doing your workouts and that kind of stuff. But you still have to deal with the jet lags, the time zone, your relationship at home, uh, not seeing your friends. That's the touring schedule. And I really wanted to take the time to develop myself as a person even more. I, I, I really felt like that I stood still as a person and that I only developed myself as an artist. And yeah. I needed that. I needed that break to, well, to, 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 I don't, I don't want to say like getting back down to earth, but living a normal life. That was, that was, that's the only thing that Tim said. He wanted to live a normal life, not being famous, not making music at a certain point. He lost his, 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 his feeling of, of, of being a normal human being. And that's, that's a weird position to be in. His influence was so far reaching and his talent was so clear, so gifted. But as someone who knew him well and as the legacy is in our hands now to, to, to continue to build around the, the greatness that he achieved in an in all too short period of time, what for you made him so special and so unique? Someone you got to know personally and someone you admired creatively? He, he was the best musician, electronic musician I've ever met. And he still is till this day and I'm... You, you, it's, you never, you're never going to convince me there's someone better in making melodies and chords and writing such catchy, catchy hooks. And he knew exactly what he wanted. Uh, songwriting, the way the singer sh should sing, uh, the way he wrote his melodies, his signature in every song. 
still being super diverse. He, he, he could make like a super rolling electro song with Lenny Kravitz, Nadia Handlick, Wake Me Up with a country, a country hook in it. It's unbelievable. And even as a, as a, as a person, you know, he was such a nice guy, such a humble person. And yeah, I'm really glad we did so many shows together and yeah, that we became friends over the years and I learned a lot from him. When I think of him, I think of Silhouettes. I know it was an early cut, but I just remember the first time I heard that and the the way, the progression, just the dun, 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 and this, the way he finds his way back to the start, to me was like, this is Mozart. Like, this is Beethoven. It was truly unseen in dance music. There was no way you could make music like that, even not even in trance music, because they always kept going with the same appetiators and the same chords and the same emotion. And Tim came with chords. Not even if you strip those songs down and take away the four by four kick drum, even if you consider it a pop song, it is next level. Not even it was even seen in dance music. Man, I, I love to hear you find a new voice through your music. I wish you all the best on this tour sold out back in the big rooms bro but i just know that you're in charge now thank you for having me man thank you